So welcome, welcome. Um, today we're talking about how you can make your business more efficient as a practice and also kind of how venture capital views medical practices this, these days. Because as, as more of you know, um, medicine is definitely moving towards this model of more and more venture capitalists are coming in, whether it's a, a practice management group, whether it's a true venture capital, and taking over practices to um, help with your billing, to help with your medical insurance rates, everything like that. So I wanted to talk from a perspective of, okay, we're all independent businesses. How do we work with the current environment in medicine, and how do we make our businesses more efficient, as well as you know improve um, how many patients we're seeing every day? So first up, our agenda is, so who are the big players in venture capital right now, especially with respect to medical practices? Um, what kind of investor might be right for your business? Also, what matters during that evaluation process by a venture capital firm? Um, who are we, Capital Practice Consulting? And then how to prepare your business. So either if you're preparing to sell to a venture capital firm or if you're really just looking to streamline your business, these are our top um, uh, tips for how you can actually improve your business and, and how it functions. So these are some of the big players and these are certainly, this is not an exhaustive list by any stance. Um, I focus on kind of the dermatology space, but there are large OBGYN practices all over the place, large primary care practices all over the place. So Anne Arundel Dermatology, Integrated Dermatology is nationwide practices. Um, Loudoun Medical Group is local to here, OBGYN, um, obstetricians, any type of specialty really. Yeah, exactly. Um, Pharos is actually a true venture capitalist firm that bought a large um, cosmetic dermatology and dermatology group recently and they're looking to, uh, to put big med spas all across the country. Johns Hopkins, obviously, Inova, Privia, and Advanced Dermatology, and some of these you, you might be familiar with, and they absolutely vary in their level of how much do they actually take over the practice versus, versus how much do you own the practice. Um, and that gets straight to the question of what kind of investor is right for your business? So it's a very involved question, but it really involves a couple of key things. So you know, what are your career goals in the next five to 10 years? Are you looking to actually sell and retire, or are you looking to continue to manage the business but manage it with having a little bit less involved in the billing, for example? Um, what are you hoping to achieve by partnering with another group? And then also, what are your big hurdles to success? So what do you feel like right now as a business are your biggest challenges? And we'll go into the different solutions for those big challenges. So business valuation, these are absolute basics, right? You would like a, a accountant to like Dan to go through these types of valuations with you to talk about what is your business really worth. But you want to engage, so again, a, a qualified accountant to really help you walk through this equation. Um, key performance indicators, which we'll come back to later in this presentation. What key performance indicators are is a buzzword among venture capitalists as to how do we rate how well your business is operating right now. And in each industry and for each venture capital firm, it's very different. And in medicine, it's obviously very different because it's a very different business. Um, accounts receivables, so you know, how far out are you still collecting bills from patients? How quickly can you collect those bills from patients? Real estate property, which I'll switch over to my colleague Penny in a minute to talk a little bit about why investing in real estate as a, as a physician makes sense not only for your short term, but your long term goals and your retirement goals, because you can get some passive income there, which is actually very valuable. Um, costs, so what are your costs to run the business, your staff, your um, billing company if you use one, your marketing company if you use one. Um, what's your salary versus what is your replacement salary? So what would we have to get to get someone to replace you? Um, your business assets. So this would again include property, but it might also include lasers. It might include certain types of surgical equipment. Um, profits. So how profitable are you as a business? So taking your salary out, your staff salary out, your marketing the costs, what do you make as a business? Um, and then this will surprise you, the most recent three to five years for venture capitalists is what they're looking for. So if you've made pretty significant changes to your business where you've suddenly become much more profitable, you gotta maintain that for about three to five years before that's really considered your business value. So that's why you wanna plan. So if you're thinking about retirement, you wanna plan now for three to five years from now. So with that, I'm actually gonna switch over to Penny. He's gonna talk a little bit about if you're interested in buying real estate, especially in this building or any building in this area, what does it really take and how do commercial lenders facilitate that for you? Because that can be and is one of the most valuable assets that your business can have. So Penny, please come Amen. on up. Amen. I couldn't have said it better, Hey, if you guys have any questions or anything, it's free flowing, just 
interrupt Please. and, you know, this is for you. Absolutely. So, yeah, if you come to be over towards here. me, yeah, or okay. that's perfect. So I just put together a little bit of information. I'm with um, Old Dominion National Bank. I've been doing commercial lending for close to 20 years. I do a ton of medical um, in terms of financing real estate, financing tenant improvements, um, you know, build out of space that either, either you own or you lease, working capital lines of credit, equipment, you name it. Um, physician buy-in and buy-out, all different types of things. But today I wanted to focus primarily on um, financing commercial real estate in terms of buying and then also financing tenant improvements in case you're leasing. And a lot of positions that I talk to will come and they don't really have, are not entirely sure what the bank looks at or how these types of loans will be structured. So I want to give you just a brief overview. Um, typical structure for owner occupied real estate financing. So owner occupied is considered if your practice is going to occupy 50% or more of a piece of property. Um, many times physicians will buy condos and they are occupying the whole thing. Sometimes they'll buy a bigger space, they'll occupy less than 50% of it and try to lease out the rest. That wouldn't necessarily be considered owner-occupied financing, so we're, you know, where you are occupying the majority of the property. Um, banks will typically do 80% of the purchase price or appraised value, whichever is less. Sometimes they'll go higher. The terms that I'm giving you today are based on typical across the board. There are opportunities where you could get 85 to 90 percent financing, and through the SBA, even a better option. Um, typically, loans are on a 10-year term with a fixed period anywhere between five, seven to 10 years. Obviously, the longer you fix the rate, the higher it's going to be. Um, amortizations of your loans would be anywhere between. Um, actually, if you go back anywhere between um, 15, 20 to 25 years on like a residential mortgage, which would go up to 30. First seat of trust on the property, um, you know, rates are going to be dependent on various number of factors, including, you know, the cash flow of, of the practice, this financial strength of the part of the physician guarantors and, and how all of that is structured. Um, typically, when you buy a piece of real estate, you're going to hold it in an LLC and then you're going to lease it back to the practice. Um, and so if you're going to buy it into the LLC and then you're going to do tenant improvements, typically that tenant improvement loan or the build-out loan would be given to the practice, not the real estate LLC. So if we look at the next slide, um, it gives us kind of an overview. I, I used the example of the property that Leonard has here in the building that's for sale, um, how something like that may be structured um, with a five-year fixed rate and then an adjustment period and what the monthly payment would be just so you can get an idea of cash flow in terms of if you were to lease, paying rent, versus if you were to invest in, in debt purchasing. The next example is based on, actually I want to point out a few things. So I, I mentioned to you, go back to the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mentioned to you um, that you know when you purchase the real estate, you typically would hold that in an LLC rather than having the practice be the borrower. Um, and then there would be a lease created between the real estate holding company and the practice. We also talked about 50% or more ownership. Um, and the fact that the tenant improvement piece would typically be to the practice and not to your real estate holding entity, because that would typically be on a, on a more aggressive amortization and payback. Um, most banks will require you to develop some type of a depository relationship um, and benefit in doing that is many times you can get a much more aggressive rate than if you are doing it just as a transaction. Uh, appraisal should always be ordered by the bank. A lot of physicians will think, I want to go get it appraised so I can see what I want to buy it for, you know, as we're negotiating the purchase price. Do not do that. If you have, because the bank cannot use an appraisal that has been initiated by the buyer for financing transactions. So if you think you want to have that done, Talk to a bank, have them go ahead and order that for you. Most likely, if you don't go with them, they'll let another bank use it. But you could easily lose several thousand dollars by doing that. And then, of course, SBA 504 financing is something that um, is an option for you. You can put in less equity. It is much more cumbersome in terms of the underwriting aspect. Um, and the fees can be higher. But depending on your situation, it may be a good, a good option for you. Moving forward. Uh, tenant improvement financing. So, 
uh, you buy the real estate, you hold it in an LLC, you're doing a lease back to your practice, the practice then, you, real estate needs build out. You need tenant improvement that not, may not be locked in, you know, as part of the negotiation with the seller. Um, or if you're leasing, it's not part of your lease. Um, the practice would typically be the borrower in this, and this would typically be financing that would cover all of the interior build out as well as the FFE. So all of your furniture, fixtures, and equipment that you would need to open up your practice or get that office up and going. And those loans would typically be on a five year fully amortizing structure. Sometimes you can go seven to 10 if you go the SBA route, but typically five years is how they would be structured to the practice directly. And typically secured by a first position UCC lien. And so that's a lien that is filed on the business assets of the practice. These types of loans are not always secured by real estate. So depending on the strength of the practice, you have your real estate loan here, and then this is a separate loan that's on the practice's balance sheet that is amortized and, and secured differently. And again, rates are gonna depend on the overall relationship. And if you do a, a construction type um, structure, you would be obviously subject to policies and procedures affiliated with construction financing and draws and that type of thing. Um, so I just did a, a scenario, if you were to do a $300,000 build out, you buy the property for a million three, you have your commercial real estate loan to the LLC, and then you do a separate loan to the practice for the tenant build out in the FFE, how that might look in terms of your cash flow. The tenant improvement loans can also be considered build out loans. So you decide not to buy. You do this scenario and you don't have the, the desire for that long-term investment, you don't have the money up front, you're not qualified for SBA 504 financing, which allows you to put less equity in and you decide to enter into a lease situation. The tenant improvement financing, also known as build-out financing, can be done. A lot of banks will finance that for you. And that, does that include architectural engineering? It does. So you'll have the soft costs associated with, with that, which are all the architectural, the permitting, all the plans, and then you have the hard costs associated with that. And so banks will typically finance that as a total project, so your hard costs and your soft costs and your ff &E into one loan. If you don't have real estate as a separate transaction, they may require you to put a portion of equity into the tenant piece, um, but again, it depends really on the overall relationship you have with the bank that you're working with. Some banks will say, you know what, we'll do 100% of that because you have, you know, Positive relation. It just it really those type of factors are negotiable depending on. I mean, to be honest, depending on the, the overall relationship. So, just kind of gives you an overview. Um, Leonard has done, and I've seen him do this, where he's run scenarios, leasing versus buying, and yeah. the benefits to that. You know, obviously, it depends on your financial situation and, and the goals of the physicians and the partners and, and the long term you know, plans for the practice. So just a little bit about Old Dominion National Bank. Um, we are a locally owned and managed bank. We are, our management, our headquartered offices are in Tyson's Corner. We have locations in Charlottesville. Um, I have been in, as I mentioned, commercial banking for close to 20 years, a lot of medical lending. Um, ODMB has a full range of, of commercial and consumer products. We do focus a lot on the medical industry um, with a lot of our senior management having you know, deep connections and, and experience there. So anything I can do to answer questions, I'm happy to do that. Don't want to take up a lot of time, but hopefully it gives you kind of an overview of, of what you would have to be thinking about. That's great. Yeah. Any, yeah. any That's questions great. for Penny? Thank you so much for the overview. Yeah. It was no, really no great. Problem. It's always better to buy than lease. Yeah, and I think that there are some things that are... It, it just it, depends on, it is, on the way it's a long -term companies are, are structured. You know? yeah. The nice thing about it is your costs are fixed because you don't have a lease that escalates every year. Every lease has a lease escalation. Right. You've got depreciation that you can take advantage of. You've got equity accumulating. And you don't have to renegotiate your deal every five or ten years. You right. Fixed. And if you decide to sell the practice, the practice that you sell it to will lease back the real estate that you own. Well, and I've had conversations with several physicians who they may own like, you know, one or different office spaces and some of them are like, oh, you know, we'd sell that. And I was like, no, <laughs> don't sell it, you know, 
because um, they're like, oh, well, MedStar owns the rest of the building. I was like, great, because you're going to have a have great a competition space, space you know, yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, because it's one of those things where, as a physician, once you retire, you know, you kind of wonder, like, well, what's next at that point? And this is an asset that would literally fund your retirement. I mean, think of it as one of the best retirement plans you could ever have as a business, yeah, right? In 10 or 15 years, you so, save the loan off. Right, right. So. Real estate is the one thing where if you can hold on to it, hold on to it as long as possible and keep acquiring sort of deal. Um, it's not always possible for all of us to have as goals. Um, so a little bit about Capital Practice, the company that I work, work with. Um, we started, uh, myself on the left and Peter on the right there, we started as, as two salespeople. We used to work with very closely with offices, selling them um, capital equipment, medical equipment, um, and specifically helping them with their marketing. Because the more products that they sold in their office, the better we did as salespeople. But what we realized when we were working as salespeople was there was a huge unmet need in the market, which is that um, not a single physician that we were working with would recommend their web designer, and not a single physician we were working with would recommend their marketing team. And so we were struggling with, um, you know, we wanted to grow a lot of these practices, we wanted to help them do really well, and yet there was no one in the market that we could recommend. And so for one of our largest clients, we kind of piecemealed it together, which is that Peter and I would go in there and we were helping her with her staff, training, helping her improve her business, helping her improve her margins. And then our third business partner, who became our third business partner, Alex, would go in there and he's our search engine optimization expert. He does a lot of the web design. He's a really great person, very reliable. And the two of us together got pretty amazing results for her. And that's really what started Capital Practice Consulting, was that we really found this unmet need in the market and we came to answer that question. Um, so back to the question that I asked earlier, which is key performance indicators. Is this something that is essential to the, the business valuation process? Um, it varies with each investor. So each venture capital is going to have their own, what they consider to be um, key performance indicators. Part of it, some of the ones that are key that I see as a, as a practice consultant are the percentage of your accounts receivables that are never recovered. So we have one client who is working on improving their $130,000 a month drop off. And he believes in giving back to the community, he believes in charity, and so he writes it off, $130,000 every month. Now, when we start to get into what goes to that drop off, there are some people who are never receiving bills. And so, you know, it's not just a charity factor in that point, it's that you're not, people aren't getting the bills to pay them, right? Um, what is the gap date from service to payment? So are you looking at a 60 day payment window or are you looking at a 30 day payment window? That makes a big difference in terms of your cash flow as, as a business. Um, what's your percentage no-show rate? So I don't like to hear that like you have about a 20% no-show rate in terms of your appointments because that wastes your time and that books your schedule with time where you can be seeing patients who will actually become business bill for with insurance. Um, what percentage of your consults are booked to procedures? So in the case of a cash-based practice, uh, that's critical, right? Because the, the procedures are the cash of your business. In non-cash-based businesses, that's still pretty, you know, essential because if you're doing major procedures, major surgeries with people, and they're deciding to get a second consult and go with somebody else, that's a big deal, right, to, to the big billable, um, you know, codes. Um, what percentage of your phone calls are booked? Believe it or not, the front desk staff of a, a medical office is critical to how well you do as a practice. That's the number one way you get negative Yelp reviews, and that's the number one way where you won't get an appointment booked properly or you won't get an appointment booked at all. Um, can the staff answer basic questions and what are their phone skills like? So these are key performance indicators that I look at but aren't necessarily quantifiable, right? Um, what's your office wait time? So even though you want to maximize the time in the office, that also again contributes to negative reviews. That also contributes also to you billing the maximum amount as possible. We don't want people waiting for an hour because we really want it to be moving fast. Um, what are your good, you know, good online reviews? So how do, how do your reviews look right now online and what do we need to do to improve them? And then do you have a professional modern website? So believe it or not, the number one thing, 94% of consumers admitted to judging a professional business based on how their website looked. So if your website is old, they go, <laughs> yeah, that's probably not somebody who's up to date on their medical skills, so I'm done, right? Which is not fair, but it is kind of the, the online world that we live in now. Um, how to think like a venture capitalist. So you start with a great bookkeeper or accountant or consultant. So they help you look at your bottom lines, your big dollar spends. Um, if you really do this, you're going through your largest items. So what are your largest spends right now? What are your largest costs? What are your largest profitability? 
Um, and then identify opportunities to grow income. So if you know that there's a, a billing code or a procedure that you do that's a big money maker, but you're really not marketing it, then those are the things that you're really kind of looking for where, okay, my number one right now might be robotic surgery, but what's number two or what's coming in the pipeline? If they change the reimbursable, reimbursable rate for robotic surgery, then what am I gonna have next for my practice, right? So it's always kind of thinking ahead. Um, prioritize both activities, which is cost cutting and revenue growing, um, because both of those contribute to you having a better profitability as a business. So how to increase your revenue? Um, so this is part of the other thing that we specialize in, which is marketing. Um, if you look at this graph, which is really hard to see, but number two on this graph right here is actually health, medical. So the number of online searches for medicine for doctors is number two in terms of what people are searching for on their phones, believe it or not. So they're looking to find you, they're looking at your website, they're making decisions online. Um, number two graphic here, which is also a little bit hard to read, is how do people search for medicine online? Um, if you're looking at this graph here, 47% of searches are symptoms. So they're looking for, okay, if I have abdominal pain, if I have, um, you know, blood in my urine or something of that nature, that's what they're searching online. It's so, Google. right, Google, Dr. Google helps them first, right? But there's ways to trick Dr. Google where if you have that on your website, symptoms like blood in your urine, pain in your stomach, things of that nature, um, and you can get even more specific, like when people are looking for robotic surgery specifically because they've already gone through the process of getting that first evaluation, and now they're looking for a secondary, an expert. If you have a page on your website about robotic surgery for OBGYN, I guarantee you a consumer is going to say that's someone who's an expert because they've even taken the time to put it on their website, right? And if you have a review about it, that would be even better. Um, modern website is really where you start. So like I said, most consumers make that judgment based on your practice and your medical profession, based on your website. They decide whether or not you're a modern physician or maybe you're outdated based on do you have a modern website or an outdated website. But the reason why it's also important to have a modern website is because all of your marketing starts from there. What's new and what's hot right now is content marketing. And something that we specialize in is highly technical content marketing, which is to say, we take your ideas and your thoughts and having been in the medical space, and I also have a PhD, I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but you know, I've worked in this space with doctors, I've done the research with doctors. We translate your thoughts into telling consumers why should they come to you, what makes you an expert. And by putting that out there on the internet, when a patient visits your website, they not only check, okay, what services do you have, what's your background, but they check your blog and they read, what is he blogging about? What are they talking about? Like, What's new in their medicine right now? And when you have that online, that's when they make the decision that this is the person that I want to go see and this is the person I want to trust with my care. So a cohesive digital strategy starts with the website. It then goes to the marketing, the technical marketing that we were talking about, which is shared to Facebook is number one right now. Um, Instagram and LinkedIn are number two, depending on your profession. So Instagram is number two, primarily for people who are in visuals. Go ahead. Even people that are over 19. Absolutely. <laughs> so, in, so 19 right now, the trends among 19 year olds is Snapchat. So we kind of stay out of the Snapchat arena, but Instagram is becoming for people who are visual learners, who love visual things, where they're really just looking for pretty pictures and this, that, and the other. But depending on your specialty, if you're in cosmetics, if you're in plastic surgery, Instagram's going to be huge. People want to see those before and after. It's a video, or you know, if you're a dermatologist that pops pimples, people are going to watch your popping pimple videos. I mean, I guarantee you they'll even want to watch robotic surgery on Instagram. It's, it's one of those things where people are consuming even kind of like very medical content, right? Some of us are very, you know, squeamish about that. That's why I'm not a medical doctor. I was a PhD. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> and then Twitter's number three. So we don't typically recommend people spend a lot of time on Twitter, but there are some people who do prefer Twitter as a method of communication like our president. Um, industry specific mediums, so different specialties might have different types of mediums, so ZocDoc, for example, is a big website. Um, Real Self is big for plastic surgeons and dermatologists. Planned, executed, and consistent, so this is key because they show that consumers have to typically see a message six to seven times before they'll actually act on it and do it, right? So if you're doing it occasionally, it's not going to be enough for really people to be like, uh, yep, okay, I'm going to finally go in and get this checked out. Um, so where do you start and invest in terms of your strategy? Um, we actually, very much so, because we're also consultants, rely on this return on investment driven strategy. So what does that mean? 
That means we focus on the data. So the data behind your website, the data behind Google. So you could rank high for any keyword out there, right? But if nobody's searching for that keyword, then why? it doesn't matter, right? So if nobody's searching for stomach pain Annandale, Virginia, it doesn't really make sense to rank for it. But if someone's searching for stomach pain Northern Virginia, then it makes sense to rank for it. Um, and I like this quote, without data, you're just another person with an opinion, right? So everything that you do as an office should be driven by what makes sense for our business and does, does what we're currently doing make sense for it, right? So whether that means you have closed deals, whether that means you have more consults, more phone calls from the internet, but you have to have good tracking for that, right? So if your front desk is just occasionally jotting down that someone said they found you on the internet, not Google, not the website, you know, not specifics, then you don't have enough information. But we do have, and we like to work with some softwares where there's call tracking software where you can actually see, I put your call tracking number on Google, so I know you've got 156 calls from Google this month, for example. Um, so sometimes we try to take the human element out of that equation of tracking as well. How much is a winning strategy worth? So um, this is a client that started with us in August of 2016. In less than one year, they went from being you know, virtually unranked on anything to having 80 first and second page keywords on Google. Um, some of the examples are Dermatologist Maryland, which are very you know, difficult keywords to rank high for. Um, we doubled their website traffic in that period of time. And I think the, the bottom line that we hang our hat on was that they had a 400% increase in just their cosmetic business. So um, because we're cosmetic specialists and we've worked in that industry for a very long, they've had a huge increase in that cosmetic business. And that's what they wanted, right? But we also helped them focus on the growth of their overall business. And we're currently helping them work on their accounts receivables because this is the same doctor who's writing off $130,000 a month. Now, I can, you know, I can improve your 400% increase in your cosmetic business, but if you're writing $100,000 off a month, a month in your accounts receivable, then you know, that's a problem. So we're working on that second problem now. Um, but they still have an overall business growth of about 30%, which for any business that's been in business, this is over 30 years as a business. He took over business from his mother. Um, that's huge, right? You don't get a 30% business growth overnight without doing anything. Um, practices that are primed for growth, so practices that we work with are, are startups. So we help startups with their marketing plan, you know, getting them a website, getting them started. Um, expanding businesses, so maybe you're moving offices, maybe you're buying offices. Uh, maybe you're adding more offices to your current location. Um, people who are also, I didn't add it in here, but retiring. So we help a lot of doctors prime their business for retirement and selling it eventually. Um, we have an expertise in medical content, obviously that's why we're here tonight, but we also do other businesses as well. We do financial planners, anyone who's in kind of like that technical space where it's difficult to find somebody that can write about what you do. Um, we have packages in marketing, sales, training, consulting, or both. So whether you have someone internally who's doing marketing that we just train, or you want us to do all of your external marketing, we do kind of both. We fit it to what you need as a business. Um, so that is our presentation for tonight. I hope it was very informative for everybody. And it was I think excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so, it was great. Thank you so much. Well done. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. You want to close this out, Leonard? Yeah. <laughs> thank you for coming. We really appreciate you stopping by. I hope you learned something. If you walked away with one thing, and it's worth your time, right? Absolutely. And please take some dessert with you because we have so much dessert. <laughs> 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 <laughs>